Welcome to today's program on the, uh, from the wellness team. Um, our speaker today, Linda White, was recommended to us by her friend Ron. I, I said that, I practiced this and I knew I was going to do this. Linda Hunt is our speaker. <laughs> And, and um, she was uh, suggested to us by her friend Ron White. And it was the perfect timing because we were planning this series of programs on spiritual wellness. Her topic, the soul spaces, fits perfectly that. And now Ron will introduce her for us. Thank you. Yes, uh, Linda and Jim have been long-term friends. We served together at Whitworth University in Spokane. And as Jeff said in his announcement, if you were at the 10 o'clock service, I recommended for Linda to speak at Roman some years ago when she wrote her book, Bold Spirit. And wrote, it was published by University Press. I think Romans wasn't quite sure. So they set up 25 chairs. 125 people showed up that evening and they were well rewarded. So when I learned that Linda had written this new book, it's really the story of Linda and Jim together, as she will tell you, this is a much more personal story. And I contacted Jeff O'Grady, all of you, to suggest this would be a wonderful part of the program that's been going on here in the church through the spring. So once upon a time, I was introduced by someone at the library company in Philadelphia who took 10 minutes to tell the audience what my book was about. I will not do that. I will let Linda Hunt, who is formerly professor of creative writing at Whitworth University, she will tell you what her book is about. Let's welcome Linda. Thank you, Ron. I need to be sure. That, is the sound system working so you in the back in here? We're all right. I'm delighted. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of your congregation for this Sunday. I was thrilled when Ron told me both about the church and then this uh, particular series you're having on spiritual health and wellness. And I thought, yes, this does fit beautifully and I'm delighted to be able to be a part of it. And a thanks to the committee and to Jeff O'Grady for saying yes, I said sight unseen. Uh, so that was marvelous. The um, well, probably no surprise to you that as an English professor, I love human stories. Uh, I'm fascinated with them, but I'm particularly interested in the silencing of stories and the and within that that part of human stories about human resilience and how people go through shipwreck times and somehow come through that with some resilience and strength. Um, and when I talk about shipwreck, what I mean by that is when life is going along a certain way and some event happens which can be gradual or it can be immediate, where life as we imagined it falls apart. This can be a divorce. It could be an illness. It can be death. It can be financial collapse or betrayal. You can name them. There's not a person in this room. I taught with university students, and when they're 20 and 21, and I had read, I'd read their journals, by 21, many had had many of these kind of experiences. So by time we live, it's just part of what, when life happens. For us, the great sorrow that I'm going to talk about in our book Soul Space, or my book Soul Space, is when two friends, four friends, came to the door at 6 a.m. one morning to tell us that our daughter Krista Hunt Oslin, who was with her husband in Bolivia on a three-year assignment with Mennonite Central Committee, uh, working with indigenous families, had been killed in a bus accident. And our lives just were shattered in ways that it's almost impossible to imagine. The during that time, I became a mother living in the wilderness of grief. Many of you know what that can feel like. And in the process, my husband, Jim, who I don't know where he went, oh, he's back there. <laughs> he had to sort of keep our lives together. And uh, he, he was deeply involved in his teaching and work at the church at that time. We've been in the Presbyterian tradition then. And 
uh, he kept things together while I wrote and cried almost for a year. It was at the end of that year that we began to think, how can we do something that really honors the life of our daughter? Krista was a woman who, when she went to serve, said that her goal really was to show God's love in action. They're telling me how to use this here. Can you see her now? This is Krista. She was 25. That's Komarapa, the village where she was serving. It was a river. It wasn't really a village with houses clustered. It was a long river with 52 families all along the river, a long ways apart from each other. They lived, they lived in a little one-room adobe home that she said, uh, we romanticized adobe homes in America, that in fact it looks like it would fall apart in the first rain. Uh, they were given motorcycles. She had to learn. She said she wanted to show her brother Jefferson her evil Knievel skills after a bit of time. But in a more serious note, she fell several times and was very bruised. And when she first met the families, she had to assure them that it wasn't Aaron beating her because that was the norm where they lived, but that in fact she had fallen with a motorcycle. But where the, the Ministry of Presence is what MCC encourages, and she was working with the village women, and they were working on nutrition. She worked with two other cities with library and literacy issues. Uh, when life is shattered, an image that was really helpful to us is this Japanese bowl. And a friend of Aaron's had sent, we were invited to go back down to Bolivia, and a friend sent a letter that he read to us in the car on the way to the airport. And we were going down to help him close the only home that they had known together like this. And the story is basically that when the bowl, this is a monk had this bowl, and when it shattered, it was an ancient bowl. And rather than just throw it away, that they wanted to keep the beauty of it, and it was put, put together with gold solder, which would be very strong and hold. And the belief is that even in our brokenness, which all of us experience, even in our brokenness, that we can have a healing that allows us to be whole in a different way. And it's an image that we found really useful uh, some of you know Gehal Gabran's statement, who talks about uh, the deeper our sorrow is, the more joy it can hold. And that bowl is a powerful image tied into that. Uh, so Jim was in Latin America. He's taken the students down there for 25 years. And we were told when Krista died that everything changes. And one thing we didn't want to have changed, we were also told that 90% of marriages break, which is not true. But that was the fact we were told by some father who'd lost his son. Um, and one of the things we decided to keep was Jim's commitment to Central America. So he is down there, and he's actually uh, having an experience where Oscar Romero was assassinated. And the next day he called me and he said, we have to do something for Krista besides cry. And so at that point, we gathered with family and friends, and some of you might know Sharon Parks' work, who works with young adults. She was at Harvard for many years, and she's Krista's godmother. And we tried to think, what could honor her life that is needed in our world? And we founded what was called the Krista Foundation for Global Citizenship. And what we knew was that there are other young adults who, like her, <coughs> really wanted to serve the world, use their education in a powerful way, take a time to do this. Um, and what we decided was that if we could create a community of young adults that would be nominated by universities and choose a cohort class each year, we modeled it a bit after the Fulbright Foundation program, uh, and in this case, we, the Christian faith was important to us, but we wanted it very ecumenical. So it's Catholic and Protestant and Anabaptist, and we have the Quakers there, and we have people serving from all different traditions, but a community where the young people could come together and be supported in a way that's really important, affirming this life choice to take a year or more of service. And I don't know <coughs> what you know about young people, and parents, but some parents are not real excited after they have paid for four years of college to have their kid come home and say, I would like to go work for nothing for a year or two or three. And this is particularly true, and we have grown very much as a multicultural community now, but it's particularly true for parents who did not have many funds 
and work two or three jobs to get their child through school. And this is the response they get. So we felt like if others could intergenerationally come alongside these young people and first say, this is a good choice that you're making. There's very significant research that if young adults take a year or more of service, and you might know some have been in the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps, Jesuit volunteers, Presbyterian Year in Mission, Lutheran volunteer, if they take that year, it can be immensely life-shaping. And so we felt it was worth affirming these were all leaders that are being nominated, leadership in different ways, but people that are being nominated who have a spirit of leadership, a spirit of service. So we started our first class in 1999. She was killed in 1998. There were nine in our first class. And some of you know the statement from Martin Luther King. He says, uh, faith is when you take the first step and you don't know where the staircase is going. And that's kind of a bit where we were. You know, we, we thought together, what do we need for young people? We thought, first, they need support. We also gave them grants where they could develop their talents but they also need service ethics. Uh, it's very easy to think that, oh, I'm going to go serve, and we're going to all do it just fine. And in fact, it can be, oh, thank you. Uh, it can be difficult for, for people to do that well. And the, you've read enough in history to you know there's times when service is destructive. So if we could talk about service ethics, if we could teach, which the Mennonites are quite good about, mutual indebtedness, that we go to learn from them. And the big goal is that when you come back, you can have an influence in your own culture. But to know that you give and receive from each other. It's not that you go give and aren't you the wonderful person to go give. Uh, so if we could teach service ethics, uh, we also, uh, wanted to build a community of peers with each other where they felt other people would be engaged with them. We do not, we are not a sending agency. So what, the reason the need is so big is sending agencies like even Presbyterian Year Mission and, and um, Peace Corps, etc. They have very little debriefing. They have good work before you go. Hopefully they stay alongside you during it. But when you come back, you're basically over because they're busy recruiting the next class. Our work has gained national, uh, national attention for the work we do. We stay beside them for four years, uh, encouraging them, having debriefing retreats, conferences, and so forth. Jim learned a lot of this through the work with the Central America students. When Whitworth University sent students at first, uh, and they went, it was very life-changing. They came home often disillusioned with America, having seen Latin, our policies in Latin America, often disinterested in immediate study, the work that takes after the adventure of travel, and some even dropped out of school. And they began to think differently, how do you help people when they've done a service experience? So we've really built in some wonderful ways of working with young adults when they return. Now, one of the things that you may know is right now there's considered an epidemic of loneliness in our culture. And surprisingly, it is not the elders, it's the young people. And we see it, you'll see it in the news when you hear about anxiety, depression, addiction, and unfortunately the suicide rate, which is so high. And it's many times quite surprising. I wrote a book which I've donated to your library called Pilgrimage Through Loss, and it includes interviews with parents of children who have died from suicide. And the devastation of that is just as great as can be. It is not just an American problem, it's a Western world problem. England has done research and the loneliness there is so big, they've literally started a minister of loneliness in the nation because of our need to work with this issue. So what we thought, what we really started to think about is how do we build a community of support where you have both support and challenge when you're in your 20s. So we started, and one of the things that we did was after about two years of working with these young adults, we built, decided that it could be very useful if we could build a place that would give an idea of 
that take the idea of what we have about community and build it in a concrete place. So we built a place called The Hearth. Ron White has stayed there when he was a researcher uh, and professor visiting at Whitworth University and lived there for a month. But it's, uh, it's called The Hearth, and our hope was that this place could become a center of community that could be really binding of the ideas. Now, the night before we built it, we had, or started, the builders built it, Jim and I did not build this. Uh, <laughs> the, the night before we built it, we had a party, and we put tiki lamps all around the places where it was going to be built, and we did blessings. We did seven blessings that we hoped of what would happen to people that came to the hearth. It isn't just for Krista colleagues. We open it to all kinds of groups and people. And these blessings, actually, they all started with a C, but we, like, for counsel, for comfort, for challenges, and so forth. And we all read these together, and I'll read you just one. The book goes through the seven blessings, and part of the reason I wrote the book is 15 years later, when I looked at all the comments in our many guest books, is every blessing that we prayed for in some way has emerged as truth in people's lives. And we felt this great sense of God's faithfulness. Uh, someone had sent a letter to us about heart-shattered lives never escape God's notice. And we felt like this place has really honored God's love to these young people. But here's the one for contemplation. May this hearth and these gardens compel our commitment to stewardship of the earth so wisely expressed in the 12th century, where do you read this, the so 12th century by Hildegard of Bingen, some of you may know her, and later by 20th century poet Archibald MacLeish, after he saw films of our planet taken from space. And here's what Hildegard wrote in the 12th century. Think of what we're living in right now. Glance at the sun, see the moon and the stars, gaze at the beauty of Earth's greenings, now think, what delight God gives to humankind. With all these things, all nature is at the disposal of humankind. We are to work with it, for without it, we cannot survive. And any of you who are following climate change right now know that her words in the 12th century are really pertinent for our lives today, that we must pay attention. And so we did these blessings, and then someone at the party said to us, they said, uh, we know someone who put prayers in the foundation of their home. You might want to think about that. So Jim and I talked, and we sent a letter off to our Krista colleagues that were serving around the world through email, asked if they would like prayers in the foundation of this, and many of them sent them back. And some were personal, many were they would might take a Bishop Tutu's prayer or Mother Teresa or something. And we literally just printed them off the uh, computer, wadded them all up, walked when after they had framed it, walked around and put them in each of the rooms. And the most joyous thing was when the guys come with the cement, uh, with the big elephant, you, you know what I'm talking about, the, the big elephant thing. They come and they look at this and say, what is this? And so we tell them what it is. And they said, no problem. It won't hurt the foundation. And they pour. Well, that was wonderful. But what was really wonderful was about eight or nine weeks later, they contacted our builder. And they said, could we bring our wives? Now, this place was not done at all. It was framed. The day they called, they were putting in a real stone fireplace, but the walls aren't done, the carpets, nothing is done. And they said to them, could we bring our wives because we know this is a peaceful place and we want to show them what we've been part of. And we were deeply touched by that because I think all of us want to be a part of creating peace and beauty in our world. So that was really pretty special. Now, the other part of all of this, when we work with shipwreck, is that we need to carry hope. And hope can be very elusive. Um, one thing that I found really helpful was that uh, I was in a cancer bout at one time, uh, early cancer bout, and 
we had been reading in Core 150 where I taught Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And many of you know that uh, when he wrote his book and he was in Auschwitz in the concentration camps, that what he noticed was when prisoners came in and they had a spirit of hope, they, they could think about something in their future that they cared about, that they could endure these horrid conditions and stay alive. Either they wanted to see their child or their wife or write a book or do whatever, but they had some in vision of hope. Those that didn't, he said, died within days, and you could almost predict who that would be. Um, and that spirit of hope uh, is really important when we work with resilience. Now, I am known for irrational hope because I am a Seattle Mariners fan. That is, <laughs> if any of you know a thing about baseball, uh, we were supposed to rebuild this year. We're the, we're the longest losing team and not being in the playoffs in America. So you have to have a rational hope to do this. But we were supposed to be rebuilding and not be good this year. We were the hottest team in baseball the first two weeks, or three weeks. We are now at the bottom again, totally. <laughs> I had said I could get addicted to this, but uh, <laughs> it is awful uh, in terms of the, the uh, sense of what happens. But hope is important, irrational or rational. Uh, I'd like to talk about a couple of Krista colleagues to give you a sense of why we think debriefing is so important. When we bring them together, uh, they meet in, we have, that's the fireplace I was telling you about. We meet in this room uh, and we meet for different things. We have a global citizenship room. So we have an African room, a Latin American room. This is the Latin American room. We have an Asian meditation room. We have a Northwest room because one of the things we're trying to help young people see is we have to know our own culture and we have to be careful that you don't throw everything out and that you instead recognize what matters that you want to keep. And it's very easy to go one way, and especially if you're young, and not think about what's important to keep. Uh, Heifetz, who works with leadership, talks about that same issue. It's very easy to drop that. We have an Asian meditation center that has a stained glass window of the earth that looks out on. We happen to have about an acre of land that's developed that goes up a hill, and then there's another acre above that. Um, and when we work with them, we try to have them think through what has happened in that experience of service that then will shape their future and the ways that they want to have it shaped. And what tends to happen is that if you don't take time for serious pause to reflect on what happens, life gets so busy, you've had this experience, you end one thing and you hardly have time to think about that because you're starting something new. And actually, when the Krista colleagues returned from very hard assignments, many in very marginalized places, uh, they immediately have to find a house, a place to live, earn some money, think about the next stage. They're in liminal space for about a year, most of them, in that process, unless they have had a direct goal immediately and got into grad school or something. Um, but when they're, when they're together, we ask them to really think about what was it that happened in that experience that they want to keep. And I want to talk to you about a couple of uh, students that I think will give you a, a vision of this. Um, one was a young man named uh, Nathan Palpit. And Nathan had served in, he served in Sudan, South Sudan, before any of us knew much about South Sudan. This was many years ago. And he uh, was the first part of a medical team that went out into the area and had a medical team that worked with people. And in this medical team, there's, they were seeing soldiers that are 14 years old carrying huge machine guns and so forth. It was a very, very difficult time. But he came home quite disillusioned. And what he was disillusioned with was the Christian leadership that was there. And that was because many had been there 15 years, never bothered to learn the language, didn't really connect to people beyond, quote, the service. And it made him angry, but the worst thing it did for those of us who knew him, he's very much an introvert, and for those of us who knew him, he was planning to go to med school, and he decided, 
I don't know if I want to do that after watching these doctors. And maybe what I want to do is go into student life counseling instead. And he's a wonderful young man. He had had good experiences at the university from their counseling centers in terms of student life. But he'd have burned out pretty quick on that one if you knew his temperament. And his folks were <laughs> quite concerned. Uh, but they wisely didn't say much. But he came to our debriefing retreat. And he was married to another Christian colleague. And they, he came. And during those four days, everything unfolded for him. And he began to realize that what what he was holding in his anger wasn't going to help him, that he had to really think through what did he care about, and what he realized is he really did care about health and science and wellness, and he went on, he went on to medical school. He took the knowledge of what he saw in suffering, and he wrote a book, he was co-editor of a book on suffering and bioethics in his late 20s with one of the leaders who this was published by Oxford University Press, raising all of those questions. And then he ended up doing postdoc work. Well, he went to Michigan State for doctoral work, ended up connected to great heart research, did postdoc work at the UW. He now has his own uh, laboratory in Australia, of all places. And they're doing cutting edge heart research. If any of you in the room have heart problems, uh, you want this guy on your side. But our point with somebody like Nathan is he has immense gifts and talents once he knew what he wanted to do with that um, and could embrace that. Another example was a young man who was very strong in physics. And he got into the finest theoretical physics school in the world in Germany. He'd been there six months. They had a break. He came home. He had been in the Peace Corps in Burkina Faso, I think. And he was in a village, no lights, no electricity, no water, no anything in the grand scheme. And he realized that after that Peace Corps experience, when he sat for the four days and talked about all of this, he realized that what he cared about most was applied physics. He wanted to go and do things right away that could be helpful in the world, like solar energy. So he met with his physics uh, mentor. And together, they decided to drop out of the, where he is with applied physics, went into a program in South Africa, I mean, theoretical physics, go to one in South Africa that had an excellent program in applied physics. And he then met a woman there from the townships. He married a woman who he was very much an introvert also. She was very gregarious. They married. He went to Carnegie Institute. He's got a doctorate degree there. He is working on the African grid. He's doing incredible work. My point on this is that as young people get in touch, take a pause, think about what really matters to them, the pause is important to think from the past to the future. There's so many stories I could tell you of some women and men uh, whose lives have been shaped by taking a pause. But um, we, there are many of them in the book. I have about 19 stories in there, no, about 25 stories of young people. And it's very encouraging. If you feel discouraged about the world, this will encourage you, because these young people are our hope when you see them committed with the lives of energy. OK, af after we built the hearth, when we were thinking about the hearth, let me go back for a moment. Uh, when we thought about it, we think place really matters. And how you give attention to place is really important. Some of you may have seen the New Yorker magazine article had three pages on paint colors and why paint colors shape our lives. And some of you know the research on prisons where they'll do certain colors to uh, lower agitation. But the point of colors is the emotional connection. And the attention we give to detail, we try to put into the heart. What is it that creates a place of community? What is it that helps people relax and talk with one another? We, um, if I go back for a moment, I think you can see, I think one of the tables is there. Uh, we really thought about what creates conversation. And what creates conversation, it's not in that picture, what creates conversation around a table besides wonderful food and some good topics and so forth is uh, if the chairs are comfortable. I made my six foot three husband go sit in almost every chair in Spokane to be sure that a man his size would be comfortable staying around the table. And in fact, that uh, has really proven to, to be truthful, that 
if we think about what we do to create space, what will make people engage in conversation so that loneliness is not the end all, but instead is a place where real conversation happens, that can be life changing. And I've had many a colleague talk about, oh, I met so-and-so, either around the table or in the hot tub, actually, and we talk about different things that have made me think in new ways about life. And so a question I'd like for people to think about is what do we do in our own spaces that we don't have to have big places, but what are we doing that creates conversation in our lonely world? What do we do for ourselves about color? When we come in, what is the feeling that we get when you walk into a room? And in the New Yorker article, it was talking about you know, a living room should be a place that invites and makes us relax. You might, in a study, want greens to calm you down. There's just a lot of psychology of understanding it. So we tried to apply that and tried to work with this all the way through. The art is Christian art from around the world. And that's been marvelous to find because some of it, like the Black Madonna, means something to our African-American women that come into the place. Uh, We've had some marvelous Hispanic art and tiles uh, off and that uh, show Christian themes. And that's really been fun for them to have a way to think. The next thing we thought about was the gardens. Uh, we had to connect. Our house is right there. Then it goes up a hill, and that was all wild. And then that had been an old barn that we tore down. And that's how we built the hearth, was a dilapidated old barn. So we wanted to build gardens. And, in gardens, part of the issue is, to that was very healing to me. Gardens were sort of my lifesaver. I told Jim I could do $100 an hour grief therapy, and, or I could get a lot of plants for $100. <laughs> and we have all decided it would have been far cheaper if I'd gone to grief therapy. Uh, but uh, we found the power of water. And many of you know that any kind of retreat center, often even elder places, have centers with water. And my mother, our daughter Susan, we have three children, our daughter Susan was being married one month to the day after Krista died. And if you can imagine calling a, a bride who's excited about marriage and tell her her maid of honor has just been killed, uh, and the loss of a sister, and of course her first comment was, what should I still get married? How do I get married with my sister's dead? But we said, you know, let's think about that. Our family might need a point of joy at this point. And she went ahead. It was back in Newton, Massachusetts. Excuse me, it was back east. Um, and we had the wedding. And then my mother wanted to do a little waterfall and pond in our house for a reception for West Coast people. So she built a little waterfall and pond, and we all sat around and grieved for a year. It was just wonderful. And we saw how powerful that was. So when we decided to really do the whole hillside, we brought in Ed Sudakawa, who has helped. He's a Japanese man who helped do the garden, the Japanese garden in Spokane, and had him counsel with our people that were building of how to do an Asian garden, and we did a bigger pond of water. He would have had us do the whole lawn, which of course we couldn't afford to do. But it's been a wonderful place for people to gather uh, just for joy and fun. One of our theories is a thing called joy dance. The night Krista died, one of her friends wrote a beautiful poem in the night in Bolivia. And he actually is a young man who has cerebral palsy, and she had taken him out to dance. It's the first time he had danced during a quince party. And he writes about how much it had been important for him to be around Kristen and Aaron and to know the joy. And so that's been part of our philosophy. Service should be fun, and it should be joyful, and people pick up on joy. And there's a lot of fun around the pond. Uh, there's a principle that, uh, that Ed Sudakawa taught us that I think is a really important one. It's called Shibui. And Shibui is a kind of energized calm, an elegant, it's an elegant uh, way of which a garden uh, matures. And what you'll see, if you look at gardens that have moss on them, if you've seen those, when you see a garden that gets moss, that's part of the inner, that's part of what happens in Shibui, that it, it begins to, it begins to weather in a way that is just beautiful. It's very calming, it's gorgeous. And ours has finally done this, it's taken years where that happens. 
But what I, lo what I love when I think about Krista colleagues being our future citizen leaders, we need leaders that lead out of energized calm, not, not episodic explosions. We need people who are, are able to think intelligently uh, and work out of a center. And the Shibui principle uh, is an elegant way of aging for a garden, but I think it's a marvelous way to think about human life, too. The, um, the uh, colleagues gather around at many of the spots. We put many places where you can sit uh, so you can meditate and find times of personal pause. We try to encourage practices, spiritual practices. We introduce them to Ignatian spirituality, which the Catholics know well, but most of us from Protestant traditions, that's not as familiar, but it's the examine that people do at night where they ask five questions about God in their lives in the day, and, and it's just one practice we introduce them to. But you can have ways in which that can work and just having pauses is a few moments in your life, as well as significant pauses that are valuable for the soul. Uh, David Brooks in the New York Times has recently been writing about the soul, and he talks about how deep the soul really can be, and that when you have major life events happen, like a shipwreck, but I think it can be good events too, when you have major life events that we need to take pause and really have time to work with that to see where that will lead us. This, we have a Latin American courtyard that has three different tables where you can have up to 25 people for groups that come. We have a lot of groups that share it. Um, a lot of conversation goes around that. This is a Celtic cross. Uh, we had a, a Krista colleague who did a, uh, wrote a, composed a piece for it and led us in a uh, dedication for it with a saxophone. Uh, we have a children's, uh, how many of you read Secret Garden when you were little? Anybody here read Secret Garden? Yes, Secret Garden. Uh, we have a secret garden at the place and there's a troll house for all the children and all the little kids who come, that's the first place they wanna go. We, uh, one of Chris's friends built a uh, barn that was built, a, a little barn playhouse that was from the old barn wood. Uh, we have a lot of plants that draw. We plant for butterflies and bees. We've had baby hummingbirds, and you feel deeply honored when they come. Uh, even the praying mantis has come. I want to conclude with uh, one thought in terms of, of uh, what I think is happening to all of us today at one level. I think I think it's not just the soul of individuals that's in trouble. I think the soul of our nation, any of us would say, is struggling. I think we could say no matter which side of the political divide we choose to be on, that both sides are hurting for wanting our nation to be more unified in some way and more supportive for our own human health. And instead, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. And we bring in intergenerational mentors to the Krista Foundation conferences, which we have every Memorial Day weekend, and we just had one. And one of the persons we brought was David J James Duncan, who has written The Brothers K, The River Y. Uh, my story is told by water. He's a marvelous, marvelous writer. He's deeply involved with environmental concerns, particularly the salmon. Uh, he's a famous uh, fly fisherman. and. He's been also involved with peace concerns. And he talks about a time when he was so discouraged about our country, how slow it is to get things to happen. And he ran across Mother Teresa's work again. And she has the famous quote um, where, where she talks about, uh, we cannot all do great things, but we can do great things with all things with great love. And that we cannot do all things, we cannot do all great things, but we can all do uh, things with great love. And he said it freed him up in a new way. He said, it gave me permission. Uh, it gave me permission to love my children again and play with my children. It gave me permission to go fishing again. And he said, uh, 
that he fishes with Mother Teresa's thing of mine. And he says, if you ever look at a big Montana river, they tend to be three to 400 feet across. And he says, what you have to look for is you have to parse, if you're a fisherman, you have to parse, look for the parsing of the river. There's usually a six inch ribbon that goes through this big, big river. And that's where all the fish bite. And so he fishes, it's the rising, the trouts get hooked there. He says, for those who yearn to make a difference, and I would venture every one of you in this room likes making a difference. When you want to make a difference, he says, apply this fly fishing strategy. In a great western river, like the Blackfoot, three to 400 feet across, every morning, look for ribbons. One small thing you sense could be done with full on attentiveness and love. What can you do when you wake up that morning with full on attentiveness and love? Ron, I'm gonna interrupt with you for a moment. I look at Ron, I got to be in his study. Not only that, I'm sure with nervousness, he let me on his computer when his book was up there <laughs> because I was having trouble getting in on something. But Ron commits with full on attentiveness and love to the research and writing he does. It's why we have the books on Lincoln. It's why we have the books on Grant. Uh, but each of you have places where you probably think, I can give some love. And so it says, think about one small thing that can be done with full on attentiveness and love. After you finish, look for another. He calls this direct, small scale, compassion activism. And it, for him, was very healing. He still does the big things, but he also knows that if he can look at each day and give something, that that is significant. And as we work with these young adults um, and learn from them and watch their attentiveness and try to encourage their pauses to take a look at their lives and what do they want to give full-on attention and love to, uh, it's been deeply rewarding for Jim and for me to be involved in this journey. And so I appreciate so much that you let me talk a bit about the journey. The book, Soul Space, um, has 180 colored pictures of what the hearth and gardens are like. It's become a gift book. A lot of people who've gotten it have given it to others and, and found it's a wonderful way for people. Some people have talked about starting their day with reading it. And a widow called me and said, she'd only been widowed about two months. She said, I go to bed at night and I just savor one small part and I can sleep better. Uh, but I do have books over there and I'd be happy to uh, autograph and inscribe if you want to give it as a gift to somebody, just let me know and I inscribe it directly to that person. They're $25 and then there's $2 tax and Jim does have a square, which is a, you can use credit cards with if you need. Um, but I hope that you'll find as you read it, I hope it'll give you a sense of hope. I hope it'll give you a sense of resilience. I hope it'll give you hope in young people and in our country, because I believe that there's stories in here that are deeply touching to life. So thank you so much. And I'm open to questions for a moment if you want. Let me see, I'm not sure what I missed here. Oh, the, this is a Chinese tree peony. Do any of you grow those? They're gorgeous. Uh, that's, that's, I think that's it. Oh, we have wonderful roses there. We've got lilies. We have lots of fruit. The chain tree. Anyway, it's a place of beauty, and people have written some wonderful comments that reinforce what it made us think that this is important for the soul. And those comments are in the book, too. So, any questions? And she'll, she'll give you the thing so you can, can hear it. Is there anything you'd like to ask at all? Anything? Okay, well, I'll go over there and thank you so much. Thank you.